whether I am knowing a deep depression, or whether I am knowing an ecstatic moment of happiness, or whether I am knowing the experience of this room or the world. Each experience is lit up by this knowing equally. All experience shines brightly with the knowing of it. This knowing I that I am is the common element in all experiences and is therefore not limited by any particular experience. If I can be depressed one day and ecstatically happy the next day, then neither depression nor ecstasy can be inherent in what I am. All thoughts, images, feelings, memories, sensations and perceptions are obviously limited. But what I essentially am shares none of their limitations. It is colorless, featureless, objectless, transparent, empty, silent. All these words are used in the traditions to indicate the non-objective quality of what I essentially am. And being without qualities or features, I have no form. Being without form, I have no limits. So when I speak of infinite consciousness, please don't think that I am referring to some extraordinary, cosmic, spiritual consciousness. I am speaking of the very consciousness, the very awareness that shines in each of our minds as the knowledge I am. That very obvious, intimate, ordinary I am is infinite consciousness. The only consciousness there is, seemingly limited by our thoughts, sensations and perceptions, and seeming therefore to become a temporary finite consciousness or self the separate self that each of us seems to be, but never actually becoming that temporary finite self, never actually being anything other than it eternally is, infinite, self-aware being, or in religious language, God's infinite being. In other words, it is God's infinite self-aware being the only being there is that shines in each of our minds as the simple knowledge, I am. And that shines in the midst of whatever experience we are having as the I am that is having that experience. What I essentially am is the self-aware screen or space of awareness which colors itself with its own activity and in doing so assumes the forms of all experience and then loses itself in its own creativity. Awareness veils itself with itself. It is not necessary to go anywhere or do anything simply to see yourself, awareness, shining in the midst of all experience, to cease losing yourself in the experience. If awareness were to be found in some experiences rather than in others, then the great search would be legitimate. All there is to experience is the knowing of it, it is up to us whether we allow experience to eclipse or obscure that knowing, or whether we allow experience to shine with that knowing. Those are the 
two choices. Our life will unfold in accordance with whichever choice we make. So I can, I can see that I'm awareness, but not the infinite, impersonal, universal. Yes. And in the inclusive meditation, I kind of feel that. But on the belief, my mind just won't accept it or something, or see it. or. Th that, this is exactly why I feel it is so necessary to undertake the inward-facing path and not to bypass the inward-facing path and go straight to everything is one. You know, fishes feel that everything is one. Fishes have no sense of I am a fish swimming in the water and there is a world out there. Infants feel one with their surroundings. They cannot separate themselves from their mother to begin with. And what we are not speaking of here is a kind of pre-verbal oneness that infants and animals experience. And it, this pre-verbal oneness is often mistaken on the contemporary non-dual scene with the, non -dual, the, the oneness of non-duality. So it is for this reason that in most cases I feel that it is important to take this inward facing path to recognize not just that I am awareness but to recognize the infinite nature the infinite unlocated impersonal nature of awareness and then to discover everything is that and these these um, two stages you, you find them in all the traditions um, in the Zen tradition when they say first the rivers are rivers and the mountains are mountains then the rivers are no longer rivers and the mountains are no longer mountains and then in the third stage the rivers are rivers again and the mountains are mountains again so the first stage and, and the last stage they appear to be the same to begin with the rivers are rivers that's how the fish and the infant experiences in the last stage the rivers are rivers again but in the first stage consciousness is merged with experience in the last stage experience is merged in consciousness so although everything appears in the same way its reality is felt and understood to be infinite consciousness so the first discovery the, the first stage is to discover the infinite nature of awareness and then to discover that everything is that The term Atma Vichara, for, for those of you that, that know the Sanskrit tradition, is usually translated self inquiry. And a better translation or a deeper translation is self abidance. And in fact, both self inquiry and self abidance are implied by the term Atma Vichara. So again, we could we could break it down into two steps. The recognition I am awareness requires some exploration or inquiry into our experience. For instance, what we did last night was the first stage of self-inquiry. Notice that, uh, that our thoughts are always coming and going, but whatever it is that knows our thoughts always remains. Notice that feelings are always changing, appearing, disappearing, but whatever it is that is aware of our feeling remains in the background to know the next feeling, etc. So in this way, we, 
we as it were we we explore our experience and we notice this presence of awareness in the background of all changing experience this is a process of investigation it it's um sometimes in sanskrit it's referred to as neti neti or i'm not this we notice that my thoughts are not essential to me they they come and they go but i remain and my feelings sensations perceptions so we we distance ourselves from objective experience we walk ourselves back until there is this recognition yes i am that which knows experience i am nothing that is known i am the knower that that is the recognition i am awareness that culminates the first half called we could call it self inquiry it is an investigation into what we are and it it results in the recognition i am awareness now from there the second part could be called self abidance there's no more any inquiry to do at least not to do with this in, in this second stage we simply rest as awareness we simply abide in and as awareness and in this abidance its its qualities its innate peace begin to impress themselves upon us so the first step of this two step process the self inquiry step is more active we we're exploring our experience we're exploring our thoughts that we're exploring the presence of awareness that remains behind our thoughts it it's investigative it's we we're doing something whereas in the self abidance phase there's less doing it's more like a resting of the mind in its essence R- being aware of being aware that's self abidance so in and it's not a clear line it's not first of all we do self inquiry then we do self abidance we in practice there's a gray line between the two one of them flows into another but then there may be a, a time where it's necessary to come out of self abidance and start to inquire again something we may be caught by a particular feeling uh, in which case we may have to walk ourselves back again no i am that which is aware of this feeling this feeling is not essential to me no matter how intimate it may seem or no matter how painful it may be it is not essential to me so now we are walking ourselves back again to our essential self and then again we we abide so in practice it's back and forth between the two but it, as time goes on there's less and less inquiry and more and more imbibe abidance and in this abidance the qualities of awareness if we can call them qualities uh, begin to as it were emerge out of the background and particularly the qualities of peace and the sense of fulfillment or if we don't want to call that happiness let's just call it the absence of lack so there is less and that we feel less and less disturbance less and less agitation but also the sense of lack which has motivated us all our lives the sense of lack begins to evaporate it doesn't mean say we walk around with a broad smile on our face all the time it's 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 not a a state of happiness just that the feeling of lack the chronic feeling of lack that has accompanied accompanied us most of our lives it it evaporates and th- that evaporation is not it's not an experience it's it's the same way that a, a headache leaves us we couldn't say that we we wouldn't describe the, the disappearance of a headache as an experience it it's the dissolving of an experience it's difficult to describe the disappearance of a headache in positive terms we don't have a name for it so it it's like that it's the evaporating or the dissolving of the sense of lack and the name i give to what remains is happiness no but the name i give it's the common name for for it's a sense of there is no lack there is no suffering it's not an extraordinary experience it is the essential nature of our being that everybody has access to but most people don't notice it because of the exclusive focus of our attention on objective experience 
But to, to go back to your question, if there is something to investigate, investigate, self-inquiry. But then if, if it is clear to you what you essentially are, then simply rest in yourself. Awareness's primary experience is to know itself. If awareness didn't know itself, none of us would know that we were aware. But the experience of being aware, is, is it an extraordinary experience or is it the most obvious experience there is? It's not a mystical experience or a spiritual experience. It's just a, the most ordinary experience that nearly all people overlook. Why? Because of our fascination with the objective content of experience, thoughts, feelings, sensations and perceptions. Because we're so fascinated by the movie, we seem not to see the screen, although all we are seeing is the screen. It's very difficult. I've noticed this, that even people who have been studying the and practicing, I don't just mean studying philosophically, but studying and practicing the non-dual teaching for many years, for decades, there is this lingering feeling that the body is aware. That right now, as we sit here, it is I, the body, that is aware. And once we start there, all our subsequent ideas and beliefs will contain this original error within them. <coughs> it is not the body that is aware. It is awareness that is aware. And awareness is not a property of the body. It is not the body that has consciousness. It's very deeply ingrained and, and it survives decades of non-dual practice, meditation and study. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 uh, it really goes to the, the heart of the matter, to, to really understand now that it is awareness that, it is, that is aware. It's true that awareness must, as it were, collapse into the finite mind in order to view objective experience. I grant that. But the knowing with which the finite mind knows its knowledge and experience is not itself finite. That knowing that, well, I kind of say that knowing is here. That, that's the first error. I point to the body no, and I say the knowing is here. You're right. Knowing is here. By here we mean the place at which experience takes place. Yes? Now, have you noticed that wherever you are, it's here? Yeah? So here is not one particular point in space. What, what is meant by here? Here is the, the place at which experience takes place. What is that place? Here is not, a, is not a place in space. Here is the dimensionless here of consciousness. And just like here is not a place in space, so now is not a moment in time. Have you noticed that it's always now? We cannot think of consciousness. That is why in the traditions we speak of um, the space-like presence of consciousness. In other words, we add a space-like quality to consciousness and then immediately we can think of it. We say consciousness is a, a vast knowing space in which experience takes place. Well, it, consciousness is not a vast knowing space. We then need to abandon the consciousness is vast idea. We have to remove, to throw away the thorn that removes the thorn. Consciousness is not small, it is not vast, it is without dimensions. Because dimensions only come into apparent existence, the single dimension of time comes into existence through thought, and the three dimensions of space come into e apparent existence through perception. Mind is thought and perception. In other words, the four dimensions of time and space come into apparent existence through 
mind, through the finite mind. But before the finite mind rises out of infinite consciousness, there is no time and space. There are no dimensions. Don't, don't try to think of that. But isn't that, isn't that our experience? What do we all experience in deep sleep? The mind is not present in deep sleep. Does anyone have any experience of time or space in deep sleep? No. Time and space is, are not properties of external reality. They are, time, time is consciousness refracted through the prism of thought. Space is consciousness refracted through the prism of perception. So the stuff that time and space are made out of is consciousness. Time and space is what consciousness looks like when viewed through the prism of the finite mind. If I were to ask you the question now, are you aware? What would you say? Yes. Okay. So you have now just made the effortless effort that you were referring to earlier. How much effort was required for you to be aware that you are aware? Very little or none. Well, was it very little or none whatsoever? Let's try it again now. If I ask you the question, are you aware? What's the answer? Yes. How difficult was that? None of How that. much effort did you make? That, that's it. Yeah, okay. That, that is, what you have just done is the highest form of meditation there is. No, I mean it seriously. What you've just done is what the Zen practitioners sit on their cushions for ten years trying to do. I'm being serious. I'm not being clever. I'm being absolutely straight with you. In the moment that you hear the question, am I aware? That which is aware in you, awareness, turns its attention towards itself. And it says, oh yes, I am aware of the experience of being aware. It took you about half a second that is the highest form of meditation there is. People practice trying to approach it for years and years and years and still feel that it somehow eludes them. But you, you went there in a second without making any effort whatsoever. Meditation is simply to remain there. And if you ever find yourself going away from that, you just ask yourself the question, am I aware? And your attention goes back to being aware. That's it. Meditation is just to remain being aware of the experience of being aware. It's not something that I am any better at than you. I, I don't have special access to it. Ramana Maharshi didn't have special access to it. He was no more qualified than you are to be aware of the experience of being aware. I, again, I, I'm, not being, I'm not being clever or facile with you. I'm, I'm being really straight with you. I am. I have no words to express myself. But all words express only me. I have no meaning. But impart meaning 
to all that is perceived. I am without beginning and end, but all things begin and end in me. I am the knowledge in ignorance. I am the answer in the question. I give myself and receive myself perpetually. I lend myself to all seeming things. I forget myself to taste the sweetness of longing. I divide myself to know the tenderness of friendship. I hide myself for the pleasure of seeking. I look for myself for the fulfillment of finding. I find myself for the knowledge of happiness. I know myself for the joy of being. I am myself for no other reason. I become ugly for the sake of beauty. I become hostile for the sake of love. I am cruel for the sake of kindness. I am vast and bright. I am the heart of the heart. I am the voice of a child. I am wonder, astonishment and delight. In ignorance, I come and go in the world. In understanding, the world comes and goes in me. In love, all is me and I am all. But for myself, there is no I or all. I am lost in the world and the world is lost in me. I am abundant yet empty, empty yet overflow. I am homeless at home everywhere. I am helpless but help all things. I have no cares but I care. I have no desires, but I long for your heart. I wait without waiting. I cannot be recognized, but recognize myself in all things. I have no substance, but am the substance of all things. I have no experience, but am all experience. I depend on nothing, but all things depend on me. I am never found, but never lost. I am the embrace of lovers and the love in an embrace. I am your call and you are my echo. I sing. Whenever you think of me, it is I that am thinking of you. I have no cause, but cause all seeming things. I do not last in time, but all time lasts in me. I am ordinary, but extraordinary. I am kindness itself. My eternity appears as continuity in time to the mind. My infinity appears as permanence in space to the senses. But I know only my own eternal dimensionless being. Existence is a movement of my breath. 
I become something, then nothing, then everything, but always remain myself. I can be separated from all things, but no thing can be separated from me. The world is my mirror and I am its lover. I am the open, empty, luminous space of awareness, in which all experience appears, with which it is known, and out of which it is made. I am peaceful like the sky. I am open like the sea. I am empty like space. I am luminous like the sun. I shine by myself. I am the substance and reality of all seeming objects and selves. I am the light of pure knowing. Turn towards me and I will take you into myself. I play, I enjoy, I am.